Welcome to UO Today. I'm Paul Pepys, Director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guest today is Marcia Weisiger, the Julia and Rocky Dixon Chair of U.S. Western History and Associate Professor of History and Environmental Studies at the University of Oregon. Along with Barbara and Carlisle Moore, Professor of English and Environmental Studies, Stephanie Lemonager, Weisiger is co-director of UO's Center for Environmental Futures. Weisiger's research focuses on environmental history and the American West. She has published three books, Land of Plenty, Oklahomans in the Cotton Fields of Arizona from 1933 to 1942, Dreaming of Sheep in Navajo Country, and Buildings of Wisconsin, part of University of Wis Virginia Press's Buildings of the United States series. Thank you, Marcia, for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. First, let's uh, take you back. What led to your interest in the American West and environmental history? How did you wind up focusing on those topics? I'll have to say I started off not interested in that at all. Okay. I had been warned as an undergraduate that there that Western history was a dying field and we should not be interested in it. <laughs> but um, I was determined to work as a historian after I got my BA in history at uh, Arizona State University where I also studied anthropology focusing on archaeology. And I thought I was going to be an archaeologist. Uh -huh. But I um, got worked for an architect who did historic preservation projects throughout Arizona and doing research for him I fell in love with Western history and uh, the ways that people um, the expectations that people had about the landscape they were going to encounter and their response to encountering the desert environment after coming from the humid east uh, made me fascinated. And uh, I've been an environmental historian and a, a historian of the American West ever since. There wasn't really a field of environmental history, though, when I started this. I began this work in the late 1970s, early 1980s, and it well, the field existed, but it hadn't really uh, hit the consciousness of the historical profession. Mm -hmm. uh, and I went to graduate school uh, in the American West and thought I'd like to talk, to think about the environment. And one of my advisors uh, showed me that there is a whole new world out there in environmental history. And so that, and I love to study how people perceive the environment, how they have interacted with and shaped the environment, and how the environment has shaped human societies and uh, individual people, for that matter. So, so you've you've already started answering my next question, which is, what is environmental history? But let me say this: Why is environmental history important? Why should historians study environmental history? Why should we know about environmental history? Well, first of all, I'll say that all of history is ultimately environmental history because we all eat. We have, we use all kinds of different environmental resources to make our world habitable, to clothe ourselves and all that kind of thing. And in the process, in just living, in just being alive as a human species, we alter that environment. And understanding how we alter environments and the un unintended consequences of our decision making fascinates me. And then I also think it's important to think hard about environmental policy. Uh, which is most of my work is intersected with uh, an understanding of environmental policy through time. And um, a lot of that has been uh, good people with good intentions who didn't think quite far ahead enough to realize what the unexpected consequences would be of their own policies as they tried to shape things in good directions. And I think it's really important for us to l learn from those lessons when we shape new environmental policies. So history has a bearing on the future. I think so, and that's <laughs> why <laughs> the uh, environmental humanities uh, group that I'm with, the Center for Environmental Futures, that's partly why we are called that, uh, because we are thinking about the future. But I think environmental historians in particular, uh, um, among uh, within history, really do think a lot about the future and how uh, what directions we're going in and how to shape that into a better future. So I know one of the particular areas of expertise that you have as a historian of the American West and of environmental history is the role of gender, the role of gender in environmental history and the role of gender in the way that humans have understood nature. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about that aspect of your work. 
Well, uh, when I started uh, my graduate work in environmental history, um, there was very little that had been written that took gender into account explicitly. There's a lot of implicit stuff about gender in environmental history because a lot of environmental history is about men who are forest workers or national park workers or hunters or what have you and thinking about how um, social constructions of gender shape their relationship with the environment. That's something that hasn't really, that wasn't really being explicitly talked about. Mm -hmm. And I read, uh, I started reading this one historian, very prominent historian named Richard White, who had written a book about uh, Navajos and how they had um, uh, been impacted by governmental policies regarding their livestock raising, mm -hmm. and read this whole history, and women appear hardly at all in this history, and I had known from my, back when I was an undergraduate and studied anthropology, one of the few books that I had read about really kind of environmental history in a way uh, was all about women and uh, their role in raising livestock on the Navajo Reservation. So I wondered, how could you tell this story mm. without really putting women at the center of that story? And um, like I say, very few people were looking at gender then, and I, uh, you, it, changes the trajectory of that story. And uh, so I think I have, I think, been at the forefront of how we look at gender and environmental history. And many, many more historians now look at gender and environmental history. But it has to do with, uh, for example, a lot of people have written on uh, women in their roles as naturalists mm -hmm. and um, sort of not recognized as scientists, like men have been, but who did lots of work in terms of ornithology, in terms of thinking about uh, local environmental changes in their communities, and thinking about environmental justice. Mm -hmm. The environmental justice movement has always been led by women who are thinking about families, uh, thinking about the, their children, and so forth. And so putting a spotlight on that, how important it is to always take that into account. I think is really important in environmental history. And the other aspect is that the, the, the history of the United States shows that gender has played a role in the way that we think about nature. So mm -hmm. say a little bit about that. Hmm. Well, there are, there are historians who have argued, actually I disagree with this, uh, that women and men really do look out at nature differently mm -hmm. from one another. Mm -hmm. that men look at nature as a subject of conquest, mm -hmm. of uh, resource extraction, that kind of thing, and women are more uh, looking at it in terms of nurturing, uh, in terms of the, their families and their homes. I mean, there is some of that. I'm not saying that that's not true. Mm -hmm. But what I found, for example, I'm working on a book right now that is on how women and men have narrated their adventures on the Colorado River as uh, river runners and tourists. Mm -hmm. And I found, uh, I expected women to actually have a different take on uh, how they experienced whitewater rafting and mm -hmm. the kind of the thrill of running rapids and all that kind of stuff. And I find that everybody is out there for the adrenaline rush. Mm -hmm. What's different is that women did tend to pay more attention to uh, bird watching and the plants around them and all that kind of stuff. So there still is this sort of women's nature writing kind of uh, line of thinking in uh, women's writing than men for the most part, but there are also men who've you know looked at those kinds of things too who are naturalists who go out in the environment. So I don't see the clear-cut split mm -hmm. that some uh, historians and literary critics have seen uh, in the past. So what are like what are the documents? What what kind of archives do you use in your work? I use a lot. I'm, I'm a person who uses a lot of government sources, so really boring uh, government <laughs> reports of various sorts. But actually, among those reports are oftentimes explorers' journals. Mm -hmm. That kind of that's how I got turned on to this. When I said I did this in Arizona and was doing this local history regarding historic preservation, I was assigned to look look at how uh, people who were uh, following uh, trails very early on in the mid-19th century and or people who really identified themselves as explorers were uh, writing about the environment and um, uh, a lot of those are in government reports so there's lots of interesting things like that but I also look at um, ethnographic studies, uh, how people have thought about uh, their spiritual beliefs uh, with the environment. 
uh, people's correspondence, the stuff that I'm working with on uh, River Runners, there's this trove of diaries, over a hundred diaries written by people who ran the Colorado River between mm. 1869 and the 1970s. Uh, from John Wesley Powell to Ed Abbey is the span of my book. Where is that? Uh, book. It's at the Huntington Library oh, wow. in uh, San Marino, California. Oh, cool. It's just amazing. I spent nine months doing nothing but reading diaries and then discovered there's other troves of diaries around that I've gone and looked at. Photographs are really important uh, mm -hmm. to me in environmental history and um, thinking hard about what the photographer's agenda was when they took mm -hmm. photographs because mm -hmm. they're often used as evidence of for certain policy ideas, and mm -hmm. so thinking more critically about those ideas, um, and a lot of scientific documents. I use a lot of science in my work hmm. uh, and try to read that critically as I think about uh, what that can tell me about how people uh, change the environment and what they understood at the time that they were doing. So um, we've, we've been talking about environmental history. Let's talk about environmental futures. Okay. So. You are the uh, one of the two faculty co-directors of the, um, this is the first year, second year? This second is year? our second year. Second we year of the, in 2016. So yeah. the Center for Environmental Futures. What led to the creation of the center, first of all? Well, uh, it, we met for the first time, I think it was maybe in 2015, um, just to sort of brainstorm. It was a group of people who were in environmental studies, uh, but we're in the humanities side of that and social sciences, brainstorming what we might do as this new emerging field of environmental humanities, which has really taken off since about 2012, mm -hmm. and uh, how we might um, embrace that term, environmental humanities, and see where that would take us. And uh, so we uh, formed an organization uh, around 2016. We had a, we've had a series of symposia that helped us to think through what we uh, care about. But we're a group that um, believes that uh, the humanities have a lot to uh, offer in thinking about how we will deal with our environment in the future and about uh, real world problems like climate change. And I've just been in a meeting that's about environmental catastrophe, how to, how to uh, um, respond to environmental catastrophes. Um, and we think that the environmental humanities have a lot to offer about that. We care about uh, environmental justice uh, as a key issue for us, uh, and about interdisciplinary uh, thinking, discussion, and research uh, in order to try to actually solve problems. And partly that involves uh, engaging people in good stories that help people to understand what the environmental problems are, what the, um, what the science tells us, what history tells us has gone well or not, mm -hmm. and so forth. Uh, and I think all of the environmental humanities have a lot to contribute to that. And what our environmental ethics and uh, emotional responses might be. So t who are some of your collaborators? Well, Stephanie Lemonager in English is one. Um, Gordon Sayer, also in English, and David Vasquez, also, also in English. English. <laughs> uh, so those are, uh, Sarah Wald, uh, very importantly, uh, in English. And environmental studies, all of us are also mm -hmm. uh, appointed environmental studies. Uh, Mark Carey in history, um, Steve Bita in history. Um, Ryan Jones, also in history. We have uh, uh, Nicholas Moir in uh, philosophy. Mm -hmm. uh, Brooke Muller, uh, who's an uh, architect. Um, when we, and lots of other people, people in architectural history, in architecture and the arts. In um, We have people in the education college. We have people in sociology. Lots of different people who have been working with us. Uh, intercollegiate, interdisciplinary, uh, really at the cutting edge of uh, what's exciting going on. We in the think so. Yeah. yeah. Um, tell us about. I know one of the components of the center is uh, annual field school. So tell us about the field school. Well, one of the things we wanted to do was to create a research, an interdisciplinary research project mm -hmm. that would actually address important issues and. We came to realize, we decided on a theme that's going to be for the next 
four or five years, our theme for um, the Center for Environmental Futures, and we decided that public lands would be our theme because there's been such an assault, really, on the idea of public lands of late, particularly here in Oregon, but really throughout the American West. So, uh, but we think that the story that is being communicated uh, by other media has been uh, a bit skewed towards those people who have grievances. And there are real grievances, there are real challenges to working and uh, recreating on and managing uh, public lands. But we also think that most Oregonians really celebrate the public lands, including the populations that have been identified as being against them, mm -hmm. ranchers, loggers, and mm -hmm. so forth. Mm -hmm. And so we want to help them tell their story of how they really feel about things. So we've been, we started in Harney County, uh, which is the site of the occupation of the Malheur National Wildlife Refuge, which I have to say is the poster child for how to develop collaborative relationships with ranchers. Mm -hmm. and we thought it was ironic that mm -hmm. this would be the site of a protest against uh, the federal government and its land management. And so we've gone, uh, last September we met with a series of ranchers primarily, but also resource managers to get them to talk about how they feel about the public lands and what the challenges are that are facing them. And we're going to be embarking on another um, interview trip in a couple of weeks uh, to interview more ranchers more members of the Burns Paiute tribe we're wanting to talk to, uh, people from all walks of life, people who are hunters, who are uh, anglers, who are ranchers and loggers and so forth. Who's the we? Who, go, who attends the field school? This is, it's uh, people who are involved with the Center for Environmental Futures. Last time we went, it was six uh, people, uh, myself, Stephanie Lem Lemonager, um, Gordon um, Sayer, and then three graduate students. And we plan to bring a similar group of faculty, collaborators, and graduate students who sit around and basically have a conversation like this with um, a rancher or a farmer and find out how they use the land and what their challenges are and why they enjoy the public lands and why they depend on them. So what are some of the other things that the, the center does? Well, we've had a number of symposia that have focused uh, largely on environmental justice uh, issues. We uh, began with a, a um, groundbreaking symposium a couple of years ago on uh, rethinking race in the Anthropocene. Uh, that was very exciting and brought scholars from all over the United States to think about a subject that most of them had not really thought about mm -hmm. uh, really hard. Uh, we just recently had a symposium that Sarah Wald organized that was on um, environmental justice, race, and public lands. It was fabulous and a huge out uh, turnout for uh, that particular symposium. Next year we plan to do one on environmental justice and toxins, uh, focusing lar largely on the Eugene community. Um, we have uh, a whole series of things that are meant to support faculty and graduate student uh, work in the environmental humanities with fellowships and uh, research grants, uh, doctoral completion fellowships for graduate students, postdoctoral fellowships, that kind of thing. We hope to bring visiting scholars. We're wanting to put on a writing workshop to learn to, to learn how to write for a general audience mm -hmm. instead of for an academic audience. Not everybody feels really comfortable with that. We mm -hmm. want people to get comfortable with writing for real people uh, and not just ourselves. Um, we uh, are also doing some things that have to do with uh, undergraduates. With uh, this uh, July, we're going to be talking with high school students about the environmental humanities and trying to recruit underrepresented populations to the U of O and get them to engage with the environmental humanities as well. So a lot of different things. And we have speakers things. all the time that come in to talk with us. So in so. March of this year, the Center for Environmental Futures was awarded a, a $600,000 grant from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Why is that a significant accomplishment? Well, it's a huge accomplishment <laughs> for us. First of all, the Mellon Foundation, you don't get to apply to them, they come to you. So somehow, I 
to be honest. I don't know quite how they, uh, why they decided on the U of O, but they had heard about us. And uh, I know that Stephanie, my collaborator in all of this, she has spoken internationally on this subject. Mm -hmm. And so that may be they came across her in that way. But at any rate, uh, they asked us to apply for this, and uh, it launches our center. We've started off with uh, some significant uh, seed money from the university, uh, also a grant from the American Council of Learned Societies to support the field school, which mm -hmm. is going to result in a, a website and, that we call the Living Map of Oregon and a book. But, um, but the Mellon Foundation makes, first of all, it makes it possible for us to um, provide these fellowships and all this kind of stuff to put on programs without having to constantly go around begging for money. Uh, to be able to support other people in their efforts uh, with ongoing projects like the Tribal Climate Change Project. We're able to help fund that uh, each year and make that more of an institution, give them more institutional support to support tribes coming and talking about uh, the environment and the humanities. Um, so, um, and we hope that it will uh, launch us to be a permanent uh, institution here in, at the University of Oregon and in the state of Oregon. Amen to that. Yeah, and uh, you've been very helpful. I was oh. going to say in that, and we really appreciate it. <laughs> um, so let's um, let's change uh, direction a little bit. So you are also a, a teacher yes, of environmental history. So tell us tell us about a class or two that you regularly teach. Well, I teach uh, two regular classes in environmental history that are kind of a survey. One from that I personally call Death and Dying, uh, <laughs> that is sort of about species extinction over time mm -hmm. from uh, the arrival of Europeans, although we start actually uh, in pre-European times with native cultures and how they too were altering their environment as they made a living, uh, although on a different scale mm -hmm. uh, and with a different set of sensibilities about that. And uh, it, that goes up through the 1890s, so I kind of outline what the problems were that were created up until the progressive era and then from the progressive era to the present which in the progressive era was when um, the earliest concerted efforts at conservation were launched as a government policy and so that second uh, part of the survey uh, taught in a different uh, quarter are uh, about sort of the rise of the environmental movement and the conservation movement that preceded it, how that's different from one another. And again, one of the things that I try to teach are about the unintended consequences of our actions, about the fact, I mean, we can't not alter the environment. Mm -hmm. it's, it's what we do as animals in this world, mm -hmm. uh, making a living. But, uh, but we can be more thoughtful about how we do that. And so getting us to think about what are the unintended consequences and the fact that the bad things that happen aren't created by villains, they're created by people just like you and me who thought they were doing the right thing mm -hmm. for the most part. Mm -hmm. And or who just weren't thinking about it perhaps either. And uh, trying to get particularly environmental studies students who come here to the U of O, with the idea that they, most of them, they want to change the world, they want to change the planet, make it a better place, to get them to be humble about how they think about that as they move forward in their own lives. I know one of the things that you're very committed to is the mentoring of graduate students. Why is that something that's so important? Well, uh, I don't know. I was a graduate student myself <laughs> once, <laughs> and I had an extraordinary mentor. And I've met many a person who has not had an extraordinary mentor, so that I know that it's that relationship is really important. I just get ex I get excited about engaging in their research. I learn from them. Uh, about things that I've never thought of or uh, haven't quite put together in the same way that they have. So I just find it very exciting and to sort of pay forward what I got uh, as a graduate student and a scholar. I know that uh, a lot of the faculty who work in environmental studies and environmental humanities um, are particularly um, active in bringing their graduate students into their research and scholarship. Mm -hmm. you, can you talk about that particular thing, so, some examples you might share with us? Well, I have to say that uh, in hi historians tend to op operate kind of in isolation, mm -hmm. um, and so uh, I, I haven't, uh, to be honest, uh, had much graduate working on my work as a 
graduate student working with me as a researcher. I have had undergraduates, though, mm -hmm. who have um, taken my course and they're asked to do a research project and sometimes those intersect with the things that I am working on who have then gone on to work with me uh, to conduct some of that research. And one person several years ago, uh, kind of a side project that I'm working on has to do with um, the intersections between the counterculture of the 1960s and early 70s mm -hmm. and uh, environmentalism, mm -hmm. uh, both being critiques of capitalism at the time. And uh, one of the groups that I'm looking at uh, re regarding that is a group here in Eugene called the Hodads. And uh, so one of the students uh, looked at the Hodad collection, which is in special collections here at the Knight Library and uh, came to me and said, I expected these hippies to be a bunch of ne'er-do-wells, but they're like really hard workers who mm -hmm. then partied hard at night, but they worked really, really hard during the day and I want to know more about them. And so we s met together roughly weekly uh, to look at the collection together and think about that. And that was really exciting to me to do something that was um, collaborative with this undergraduate student. And so, I, tell I try to build on Tell us a little bit more those. about the Hodads. Who were they? They were a tree planting collective here in Eugene that uh, was started by a couple of guys who were unemployed and uh, first started working for uh, a private contractor to replant trees after uh, trees had been clear cut and uh, didn't like their employer and decided that they could bid on these contracts themselves with the Forest Service and did so. And they built a multi-million dollar collective it's, uh, where, I don't know quite how to explain it, but they would pool their money, bid on these big contracts, multi-million dollar contracts with the federal government to replant uh, various clear-cut areas for the Forest Service. and. Uh, the money that they would pool, that they had to do so to uh, provide um, a bond for their work mm -hmm. in taking mm -hmm. on these contracts, they then lent that money to countercultural groups in Eugene that were starting interesting projects. And for example, Wow Hall was one of the places that they helped to fund the purchase of and uh, rehabilitation of. So uh, they, their, um, influences felt far beyond uh, tree planting. But at the same time, they also then worked to stop the spraying of certain pesticides uh, and became very active pesticide workers. And so one of the things I'm wanting to look at there in that particular study is the long-lasting uh, influence of these people who, they disbanded but uh, as, a, as a group, the, as the Hodads, but they, um, are still many of them working in uh, NGOs and in governmental positions trying to um, protect us from uh, toxic um, pesticides and herbicides. Are they any of them going to be involved in the, the, the toxic uh, symposium that's coming? I am hoping that uh, they will be involved. We haven't uh, put together all the speakers for that, but uh, I think they're a very important part of the story. So. At any rate, we will be inviting them. We'll find out. So, Marcia, we've come to the end of our time. I want to thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today on this last day of spring term of the, uh, of the year. Uh, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you. I've been speaking with Marcia Weisiger, the Julie and Rocky Dixon Chair of U.S. Western History and Associate Professor of History and Environmental Studies at the University of Oregon. Along with Professor of English and Environmental Studies Stephanie Lemonager, she is also she is co-director of UO's new Center for Environmental Futures. Thanks again. Thanks for watching. <laughs>